I am a writer and painter devoted to the subject of myths, dreams, terror, superstition, and the strange. I am currently working on a series of papers that focus on the gruesome events that occurred in Redacted National Park, Alberta, Canada. Vampire in the National Park Interview Transcript of Jacob Wingate at the request of the family members of the deceased, the names have been changed. Out of respect for the dead, the rest has been told exactly as it occurred. October 25th, 2011. Reporting Officer, Detective Adrian Wozniak. We would like to make an audio recording of the interview, if that's okay with you. Just to clarify, you're not under arrest. You're free to go anytime you wish. Just listen to us. You don't have to answer any questions and stuff like that. We just want you to relax and open up to us. We're not going to jump on you and give you a hard time or anything like that. We're here to let you talk to us. Or to talk to you a little about how you've been doing and how you're feeling. I have a feeling there are things on your mind you need to let out and I'm going to give you that opportunity. It's pretty clear that something real heavy is bothering you. I imagine things have been real tough for you as of late. Yeah, we understand that. Your family is worried about you, your parents, your brother, your sister, you self committed into a mental health institute, we're told you became catatonic. After you recovered, you were released and kind of dropped off the face of the planet. But you're better now and ready to talk. That's good, Jacob. We want to help. We're not here to point fingers. If you got a chance to meet the relatives of the deceased family you discovered, you would know they were decent people like you and your family and that they deserve closure. The report says that you found the Chang family in that cave and that they had all been mauled by an animal. But the coroner says that the bite marks on the bodies belong to that of a human being. Can you? I want to tell you. I want to tell you everything that I saw, experienced, that I learned. I want to fully cooperate with you. But I know you're not going to believe me. I don't expect you to. I don't see how you possibly can. Even I have a hard time believing my memory. Just start from the beginning. Okay. I was a volunteer with Sarvac. That's the Search and Rescue Volunteer Association in Canada. Right. We had received the call in May. It was fire season. I'm sure you remember that. Huge amounts of land were burned, communities swallowed up by flames, plumes of smoke drifting across the country, even down into the US. I remember the fire bans that were set in place. Fire permits were cancelled. No open flames of any kind. Hefty fines were handed out to violators. Tell us about the call that was made that day. It was early morning when a park ranger came across the campsite that was in shambles. He happened to be driving by in his Jeep when he noticed a group of tattered tents. The windows of the SUV were shattered. The ranger thought it looked like a possible grizzly attack. The parents, two daughters and son were nowhere to be seen. There was no blood, no animal hair or prints. If a predatory animal attacked them, there should have been something. I know. It could have been any number of things. Bear, mountain lions, wolves. Tell us about when you arrived. It was still morning when we arrived at the National Park. Even though the sun was rising, we couldn't see it because of all the smoke that the wind carried with it. The sky was still dark and gray. In the past, people have gone missing. Hikers, seasoned outdoor people, old, young. Sometimes it was a case of someone straying off a path or making a wrong turn, but for the most part, they would be found alive and shaken. But something seemed different about that day. 
There were multiple teams of people dispatched through the park, on foot, with scent hounds, horseback, jeep, helicopter. Hiking trails were searched, main roads, back roads. We had people going through the brush. The report says, you discovered a cave about 10 kilometers south from the campsite. Yes, it was an undocumented cave. Nobody had known about its existence until recently. My team had been in charge of going through the brush on foot. The dog handlers were arguing among each other. It was because the dogs were acting strange, like something had spooked them. They were whimpering and whining with their tails stuck between their legs. Some of them were even hiding behind their handlers. It was very bizarre. The dog seemed sure about the scent trail, but as soon as we got to a certain area, they recoiled in fear. What can you say about the cave? The cave? How did you find it? At the time, I had entirely failed to notice where I was going exactly. It's hard to describe what I felt, like I was in some kind of trance. I almost felt like I was being called by someone. I don't mean I actually heard a voice, but I felt compelled to head in that direction. And on the ground directly in front of me, I found a pink Nike shoe, a little girl's shoe. At that moment, it was as if I returned to consciousness. About 20 yards from where I found the shoe, was the cave entrance obscured by large spruce trees. After you discovered the shoe, you found the cave and you decided to check it out. The cave entrance was a hole in the ground, big enough for a person to crawl into. I stood at the entrance of the cave, staring down into it. The floor sloped at an angle. I took out my flashlight and made my way into the very mouth of the cave shining the light into the darkness trying to spot anything. I had to crab walk my way down the sloping floor. Listen, detective, there are things that are, how would be the best way to put it? Things that are out there. Strange things, you know. I'm not sure you're going to believe me. You'll call me crazy. I assure you, I'm not crazy or making up any of this. We don't think that. We want to help you. And you'll help us. Just tell us what you saw. Okay. The first thing I saw in the cave were petroglyphs carved into the very rock by ancient indigenous people. There are many of these located throughout the foothills, the Rocky Mountains, many of them thousands of years old. These particular ones depicted hunters chasing the mighty buffalo off of cliffs. I remember reaching out and tracing them with a finger, all the while thinking to myself, I might be the first person in ages to lay eyes on them. What did you find next? Several feet away, I found something on the cavern floor. It was what appeared to be a very old leather satchel. I felt my heart jump a little as I approached it. It was cracked and coated in countless layers of dust. I carefully opened the bag and found a broken compass, a rusty water canteen, a leather bound book titled La Demon, and a flintlock pistol with the year 1715 engraved into the side. I remember staring down at the contents of the bag with the flashlight becoming warm in my hands. I sat there trying to make sense of things. That's when I was startled by a noise. What was it that you heard? It sounded like something being broken, a snapping sound. What did you do next? I shined the light farther down the cave tunnel from where the sound came from. I decided to move towards it, but it required me to go farther down the sloping cave floor. And when I got to the bottom, I saw a pair of feet 
one foot a pink Nike shoe on it, the other was bare. I hurried down as fast I could and found a girl of no more than seven. She was dead. Her neck had been broken. But there were other injuries listed. Yes. On both sides of her neck were deep puncture marks, her arms and legs as well. All the color in her skin was gone. It was as if all of her blood had been drained. And the look on her face, that expression of complete horror. I could hear the sound of my beating heart in the silent cave. I began to feel faint. I began to cry right there in those depths. The cold indifference of the universe had hit me like a train. This child suffered an agonizing death in that inky darkness. With my trembling hands, I began reaching for my radio, but I was distracted by another sudden snapping sound. The rest of the Chang family was down there. They were piled on top of each other, like a heap. They suffered the same fate as the little girl, broken necks and punctures on the legs and arms, blood removed from their veins. The report says that this was an animal attack, possibly a mountain lion. I didn't say that. I said that it was something. Tell us about it. You wouldn't believe me. Try me. It was a thing that shouldn't be walking, something that was once dead, but given life once more. There are cultures across the world who have a different name for it. The thing that I encountered was a vampire. A vampire. I'm not talking about a man in a cape or some pale heartthrob. I'm talking about a creature a parasite, a leech. While it shares similarities to things in nature, it is a thing that should not exist. What I saw was crouched on top of the family members, directly above the father. It had its face buried in the man's neck. I distinctly remember hearing a sucking sound. The man was still alive. I could hear weak choking sounds coming from his throat. I can still hear it now. What did it look like? At first glance, it looked like a small human being, much like a child. I don't even know the best way to describe it. Do you watch the National Geographic channel Discovery Nova? If you have, you're probably familiar with Otzi the Iceman, that 5,000 year old ice mummy that was discovered frozen in the Alps. That is the only thing I can compare it to. It was draining the life from that poor man. Its eyes were closed and it was moving its head from side to side. It withdrew its bloody maw from the man's neck and cruelly broke it. It turned its head towards me and opened its eyes. They were like black marbles, the pupils a bright red. I froze in place. My mind simply could not accept what was right in front of me. My body began to feel numb. I was having difficulties breathing and my thoughts were racing through my brain. Primal fear had taken over. It was that very fear all of us inherited from our ancestors the very ancestors that would have been scratching the dirt, very mindful of the day hours left, because the night was dangerous. That was when beasts would come out. Stealthy, like phantoms, you would never know they were there until it was too late. Now and then someone would sleep just a little bit too far from the fire and be pulled away into the long grass. Their agonizing screams would fade into the night. I think that maybe human society is like a little bubble that we like to surround ourselves in. We surround ourselves with light, noise, and other people to keep out the cold, 
dark, and the unknown that exists on the fringes that forms the wider universe. We shun the notion of an otherness being out there beyond the human world waiting to come in. Maybe the reality we live in is a dark and capricious universe that allows these things to exist. Perhaps one day you're just going on about your everyday life and the universe just points at you and says, Oh, there you are, a curious human being. I've been looking for you. What happened next? The next thing that the creature did was to stand up bearing its sharp teeth like a feral animal. It cocked its head and smiled at me. It started to speak. It talked to you. At first, it was an incomprehensible whispering gibberish. But soon it became clear. What did it say? I am the past. You are the future. What does that mean? I don't know. The thing took one step towards me. In a desperate panic, I drew my emergency flare gun and fired directly at the thing. The whole chamber was lit up with a blazing red light from that sizzling flare. A moment later, I realized that the creature had actually caught the flare in one of its hands and was holding it. I bolted out of there. I scrambled back up the cavern and tripped out out of the surface. A beam of sunlight broke through a clearing in the smoky sky. Next, I made contact with the rest of my team and told them about the family down in that cave. Armed officers made their way into the cavern. They found the deceased family, but there was no sign of the creature. That thing is still out there. I don't think you can hunt it down and kill it. Is there anything else you can say? Yes. I spent some time looking into the history of the park. Back in 1985, a team of geologists discovered a hidden burial chamber at the base of one of the mountains. Inside that vault was what appeared to be some kind of box, a stone and wood coffin. Radiocarbon dating places it in the 29th century BC. Nobody knows who the coffin was meant for or what happened to the remains. Ever since that encounter, I can't help but glance over my shoulder, always expecting that thing to appear behind me. There are nights where I wake up screaming from a recurring nightmare. Tell us about the nightmare. I find myself walking on a long stretch of shore next to a lake, sand edged by surrounding forest. I know this lake. I used to frequent this place with my family when I was younger. There were campgrounds and hiking trails surrounding it. But this time, I was by myself on the great expanse of sand. It was autumn and the sun was low on the horizon just peeking over the edge of the lake. Everything was basked in an orange glow of the setting sun. There was a bitter wind that was whipping sand around, and I had to place my hands over my eyes to keep sand and other debris from getting in them. At first, I thought that I was alone on this lakeside beach, but I glanced behind me and found that I was in fact not alone. In the distance, there was a person who was from what I could see making a great effort to catch up to me. I stopped to let the person catch up, but something wasn't right. Despite the person apparently running towards me, he or she made no progress. The distance between us was not closing. I guess apprehension took over me because I decided to start moving. And that's when I heard something. It was like an electronic mewling sound, like a bass note from a synthesizer. It was coming 
from behind me, from that person. I looked behind me, and I really wish I hadn't. There was something different about that person now. It was the motion. It was like the person was having a violent full body spasm. The limbs flailed about wildly. The person bent at the spine in ways impossible without breaking it. The head twitched around in much of the same manner. And in an instant, the person was directly in front of me, and I fell backwards. I remember ash color skin, black eyes with red dots for pupils. Thank you for your time, Jacob. We'll talk to your family members for a little after this. And if you ever feel like you need to talk to someone or anything like that, there's nothing wrong with that. Just let your family know and call us. All right. Okay. We're ending the interview at 1644 hours. The Quantum Vampire the first series of papers will delve into the mythology that has persisted through the eons. Here be dragons. You are asked to imagine massive snow capped mountain ranges that sweep the breathtaking landscape in every which way you happen to look. Visualize a high altitude wind swept steep interspersed with turquoise legs. This is the roof of the world, the Tibetan plateau. Now, imagine for a moment that it is a breezy and overcast spring afternoon. There is a child wrapped in double layered robes who is stomping through melting snow. That rambunctious kid is me. The year was 1988. And this is where my lifelong obsession would begin. An obsession with things that should not exist things that stand defiant in our understanding of the world, things that invoke mind blasting terror on those who would gaze upon it with naive eyes. My foot caught in a small opening in the ground, my forward momentum causing me to land on my hands and knees. I corrected myself, wiped off the snow and dirt off my clothing and peered into the hole something grabbed my attention. Stuck in the permafrost was an oddly shaped rock. Fishing out my pocket knife, I removed it from the frozen soil. The object was not a rock, but rather a bronze amulet. The amulet depicted the head and face of a creature that resembled a man, but there was something distinctly inhuman about it. It was ghoulish and malevolent. I got the impression that this object was very old. A tremendous gust of wind nearly knocked me over backwards onto the ground. I quickly pocketed the amulet and made my way back to the monastery. My journey was in haste as the wind continued to accost me with its cold and bitterness. But it was the slowly increasing sense of dread that seemingly came out of nowhere. I felt as though I was being watched by someone. I stopped in my tracks and glanced at my surroundings. Not a soul was in sight. Soon pictures began to form in my brain images of ancient runes from some unknown point in time. In a recess, I glimpsed something that caused my heart to nearly leap from my chest a draped form standing in the shadows. I could make out a face that was partially concealed by a hood that hung down at the brow. What I could see was skin that was pale, like freshly fallen snow with thin cracked lips that curled back to reveal sharp teeth. And just as soon as the images blinked into my imagination, they vanished like any other fleeting thought. It wasn't until later that night, I would bear witness to a grisly and nightmarish sight. I recall tossing and turning in my sleep, I kept hearing strange noises on the wind that never let up. I was jealous and frustrated that the others were sleeping so peacefully. 
I was feeling very thirsty, so I decided to go get some water. Just as I began to sit up, a tall and lanky shape emerged from the shadows. It was an emaciated thing, in tattered robes whose face was concealed by a hood. I spotted two glimmering pinpoints of red lights in its sunken black eyes. I was frozen in my bed, hoping that the thing didn't spot me. I detected a strange low ringing noise in my ears, like tinnitus, and I swear to you, I could hear whispering. It was like a coffin chorus for the damned. A voice broke through. I know you're awake. It was fully aware that it had an audience of one. I was frozen in place, petrified like a scared animal. It began feeding on the children. One by one, it clamped its jaws onto their necks, carnivorous teeth plunging through tissue and drawing up blood. The grotesque sound of its feeding, the sudden opening of the victim's eyes, confused and terrified at what was happening. And after it was done, it proceeded to swiftly break each of their necks. Their heads were rotated completely around with sickening cracks. Tears were rolling down my cheeks, and the sudden realization that I was the last one hit me like a storm. I wanted to scream. I wanted to race out of the monastery. I wanted to escape. It raised a bony finger to its lips. The looming shape approached and knelt down right next to me moving its head towards me. I became conscious of a distinctive metallic odor, mold and soil. The red shimmering pinpoints in its eyes dilated like an eclipse. It stretched out a pale hand and opened its palm. A grave and disembodied voice commanded me. You have something of mine. Give it back to me little one. With trembling hands, I reached under my pillow and withdrew the bronze amulet and placed it onto its waiting palm. The thing closed its fingers around it and stood up. It vanished in the blink of an eye, leaving me alone in the dark with my dead friends. Vampires, they're everywhere you look in movies and television, literature and art, even video games and Halloween costumes. All around the world, there is a belief in vampires. Ever since the dawn of time, humans have believed in such things. There are so many ancient legends, so many variations of the vampire creature. Some are shambling ghouls who dig themselves up from the ground to feed on the living. Others are glamorous sex symbols who charm their victims. Some can even turn into bats or other animals. Legend would tell you that they burst into flames when exposed to the sun, staking them through the heart as a surefire way of eliminating them, and that they dislike silver and garlic. We are to believe that they cower in fright from religious icons and prayers. Or to prevent the recently deceased from returning, rocks were crudely shoved into their mouth before burial. None of these things are accurate or correct. Even if you were able to destroy such a creature, their essence would be carried on the wind only to find another host to inhabit. Quantum vampires are an outside alien consciousness that can inhabit a physical form and use it as a vehicle for its own purposes, feeding off of living things to sustain its hold in their existence. But it's impossible to understand the motives of creatures from the spaces between and what they truly want. From my research, I have found that there are 13 that exist in the world scattered across the planet. 
There is no secret vampire society or underground cult. If anything, they're isolated and highly territorial. While it is true that there are people out there who worship and venerate them as if they were deities, there is no alliance. We are like cattle to them. They want to draw our blood like a crimson lotus and lap it up with their tongues. Lore of the Land Just imagine for a moment that you are a time traveler, a visitor through time and space. Prairie bedrock built of layers of sediment accumulated over a period of tens of millions of years. At one point, they lay submerged beneath an enormous shallow sea. Speaking in geologic terms, a recent cataclysm, the Rocky Mountains of the West pushed upwards to the sky like otherworldly monoliths. Eventually, land would emerge, a tropical land where the mighty Tyrannosaurus and other massive beasts existed. However, there would come a time where things changed. That was when the ice would arrive. In the past billion years, there have been at least three ice ages, each one roughly lasting 100,000 years. The ice would advance and retreat. In the last ice age, giant sheets of ice would carry massive rocks and debris to the north and the Rocky Mountains, eroding and smothering the land. You would hardly see the land. Instead, a vast ocean of ice and snow would greet you. Then, about 12,000 years ago, the ice began to melt. The land was carved by raging glacial waters, creating lakes and rivers. In present time, the beautiful prairies are the result of such a lengthy process, a landscape that consists of gorgeous forest, grasslands, hills and valleys, canyons and colorful cliffs that reveal different sediment layers. One can see the mighty buffalo grazing on luscious grass, powerful grizzly and black bears journeying through the wilds, coyotes and wolves running about in packs, and stealthy mountain lions stalking the dense brush. It is a primitive landscape that can haunt your imagination with its elegance. It is known that First Nations people have lived in what is now Canada for at least 15,000 years, although there is evidence that suggests they may have arrived even earlier. For thousands of years, nomadic hunting people followed big animals for food in their desperate struggle to survive. Many groups of these wanderers coalesced into tribes with their own ways of life, their own cultures and beliefs. This, of course, serves as a backdrop to something which defies mankind's understanding of the natural world. There is something that exists within the Rocky Mountains and the foothills of Alberta, something that has existed for an unfathomable period of time. There is an oral tradition that tells the legend of two tribes who were at war with one another over sacred land. One day, the aggressor tribe attacked the keepers of the sacred land. Big Bear, the tribal chief of the keepers, and his mighty warriors were able to drive off the attackers. But many of his people were killed in the attack. His wife and his son were among the dead. Over time, Big Bear became a diminished man who was heartbroken for the loss of his loved ones. He approached a shaman called Stanzalone, who wanted to end the war once and for all. Stanzalone knew of an ancient and forbidden ritual that would bring an end to their desperate situation. On a crisp winter night, Big Bear retrieved the body of his deceased son, Little Crow, and with Stanzalone they journey into the foothills where a circle of standing stones have stood since the time of the mist. Little Crow was placed into the soil at the center of the stones. Soon, green spirit light began dancing in the sky so high above. The two of them made their way out of the foothills. Stands alone explained to Big Bear that one of the great old ones would descend from the heavens and inhabit the body of Little Crow, bringing him back to life 
and to end the war. Afterwards, the great old one would return to the sky and little crow would be returned. Several days would go by. Big Bear's tribe continued to be attacked by their enemies, losing more of their people. The tribal chief began to lose faith in Stands Alone, believing that the war would never end and his son would never return. One day, the attack stopped. There was no more desecration of their sacred land, no more loss of his tribe. The tribal chief and the shaman ventured into enemy territory. What they discovered was the site of forbidden horror. Men, women, old and young, were all found dead. The look of terror was frozen on their faces. There were bite marks on all of their bodies, the blood drained from them, and their heads twisted around. Only one stood in the falling snow among the dead. It was Little Crow. A great joy overtook his father's heart, and he stepped towards the boy. Stands alone, stopped Big Bear. The shaman was concerned. They looked at the little boy who stood in silence watching them with what appeared to be a restrained hostility. Big Bear shouted for his son, Little Crow. Something was wrong with the child. His eyes were black like the night sky with red starlight in them. His skin was unusually pale. The boy's stomach was bulging and bloated, sloshing with its contents. The boy tilted his head and stared directly at his father and grinned. His teeth were sharp like arrow tips. The boy spoke, but it was not his voice. Little Crow is in here, but it is not he who responds. Stands alone got in between father and son. He knew something was wrong. Their enemies were slain. The war was over. The task completed. The great old one should have released the boy. In the name of our ancestors, I command you to leave the boy. You must return him to his father, and you must go back. Little Crow snarled and clenched his blood-soaked hands. I am older than men. I am older than the mountains and rivers. I am older than your world. I am eternal. Do not call things into your realm that you cannot send back. Little Crow pounced onto the shaman and bit down on his neck, drinking his very life and snapping the old man's neck. Big Bear attempted to restrain the boy, but Little Crow threw him down into the snow. I am the infinite thirst. I am the darkness from beyond the stars. I will return to your tribe and satiate my hunger. And you will watch. And so Little Crow returned to the tribe later that night, dragging his screaming father by his feet. The boy, who was being driven by the great old one, began attacking everyone. Unbeknownst to Little Crow, there was another shaman who foresaw this. A box was constructed from granite and wood. It was then filled with soil from the standing stones. Soon, the song of beating drums and chanting men calling for their ancestors to aid in their time of need filled the air. Just as the sun began rising in the morning sky, Little Crow was blinded by it and forced into his prison of stone and wood and sealed within. It was hidden in a dark cave at the base of a mountain and sealed away. 300 years ago, a group of French alchemists who were obsessed with immortality heard the legend of Little Crow and began seeking out his burial site. They made a black pilgrimage into the Rocky Mountains. During their journey, they performed a hymn. They discovered the sarcophagus that was hidden away for thousands of years and loosed him onto the world. Little Crow was free once more, 
The great old one now haunts the wilderness, always questing for new horrors. It's interesting to note that several fascinating finds were discovered throughout Redacted National Park in 1985. A mass grave containing vast amounts of human remains was unearthed. There was also a strange coffin made of stone slabs and wood found within the mountains. A curious archaeologist discovery indeed. Unfortunately, there were several bizarre deaths that happened shortly after the discovery. The site of the coffin was in a cave where the soil was teeming with an unknown species of protozoa that had ill effects on the people who first entered the cavern. Swift Runner and the Mountain Lion The never-ending flow of time would continue, and man would cross paths once more with eldritch evil. It was December 1874 when Swift Runner and a frontiersman named Boone were tracking down a man-eating mountain lion responsible for several deadly attacks at a nearby outpost. It was a gray overcast day with a light snowfall. Armed with flintlock rifles, the two men followed a trail of bloody footprints into the forest. Hours went by and the sun was starting to set. They found a clearing in the trees. In the middle of this snow-covered field, they found the mountain cat perched atop a large quartz rock. The mountain lion was staring down at them with its yellow eyes. It was watching them with predatory curiosity one might expect from such an animal. The wind suddenly picked up in strength, causing the snow to drift. Swift Runner and Boone shouldered their rifles and took aim. Just as they were about to open fire, they were both distracted by a low ringing noise in their ears, followed by disembodied whispering coming from the surrounding trees. The ringing noise increased in volume and intensity, causing both men to fall to their knees. The cougar seemingly took advantage of the situation and clambered off the rock, tackling Boone and locking its powerful jaws onto Boone's face and it began retching his head back and forth violently. The man's smothered screams echoed through the snowy forest. The world began going dark for Swift Runner, who was crying in agony from the ringing noise in his ears. Soon the fading world began to return into view. The ringing in his ears subsided, and the whispering stopped. Boon was gone and so was the big cat. All that remained was blood and the rifle in the snow. The snowfall became even more heavy now, visibility becoming worse, and the biting wind increased with savage gusts. A moving shape appeared in the distance, moving toward him like a terrifying apparition. Swift Runner was not alone in the secluded field. It was child size. It was gaunt with skin pulled tightly over its frame, like a frozen and mummified corpse. The malignant thing spoke to him. My pet has developed a taste for the flesh of humans. It is going to be a long winter, after all. Swift Runner trembled from the cold and the terror that stood before him. Do you know what I am? Swift Runner stared at the creature, his heart and mind racing, desperately holding on to his sanity. You are the Wendigo, the spirit who feeds on men, Swift Runner responded. He broke his gaze and stared down at the snow-covered ground. Perhaps I am. What I do know is that I am forever bound to this land, the mountains and valleys, even the very soil we are standing on. I must return to my site of origin. It is that time again where certain stars are visible and a ritual of utmost importance must be completed. If you wish to continue your existence, you will help me cross the nearby river. The currents cause this vessel to foam at the mouth among other discomforts. Quite. An irritant. Swift Runner 
would eventually return to the outpost, a man that would forever be changed. A few years later, during a particularly cold and miserable winter, he murdered his wife and children. He cooked and ate their flesh. Eventually, he would be arrested and brought to trial. He claimed that he was possessed by the spirit of the Wendigo and was compelled to commit these horrible acts. He insisted on his story being true right to the moment he was executed. The Thirteenth Vampire This is a continuation of a series of papers I'm working on, which detail the dreadful events surrounding the existence of quantum vampires. Strange and otherworldly occurrences have been frequently increasing in recent times around this part of the world. This is my attempt to chronicle them. Warning Signs I am a haunter of strange and faraway places. The catacombs of Paris, the mausoleums of Timbuktu. I have climbed the ancient towers of the Chechen mountains. I have descended the cobweb steps beneath Istanbul. I have visited places where ancient evil once walked. I have dedicated my life to researching and understanding things that should not be. The city the reader is asked to consider is Carswell. It is located just north of the 55th parallel north. It was originally founded as a series of trading posts in 1892. The city is surrounded by farmland to the north, east, and west. To the south is the vast boreal forest which is populated by aspen, tamarack, lodgepole, pine, jack pine, and black spruce. All of this extends well into the foothills of the Canadian Rockies south and southwest of the city. However, the forest in and around the city have long since been reduced by human activities such as oil and natural gas exploration. The terrain around Carswell is generally flat to gently rolling, with ravines and deep river valleys. The city is bisected by the Tuscany River, which originates in the ice fields of Redacted National Park, which is located 260 kilometers from Carswell. I journeyed to this part of the world to investigate a new cycle of vampirism. We are now at a unique point in time and space to witness such an event. I met with Audrey during midsummer of 2012. She arranged to meet with me at the Royal Museum located in downtown Carlswell. Audrey was aware of my research and discovered something that would be of interest to me. She was an archaeologist from Asheville University who was involved with a year-long excavation in the National Park in Alberta, Canada. Audrey was an elderly woman with a weathered oblong face. Her green eyes were tired and bloodshot. Her frizzy winter white hair was hastily tied up in a ponytail. Her clothes hung loosely off her weak and frail form. Her movements were lethargic and painful. It was as if she was on sanity's edge. Her team had stumbled upon an area rich with a concentration of artifacts. The importance was clearly evident right off the bat. Her team went to the location and dug a couple of holes and uncovered archaeological materials. Spear points, arrow tips, knives, scrapers that all would have been fastened to a wood or bone handle. Her team was pulling this stuff up in chunks of boreal loam every time they put a shovel on the ground. Ancient nomadic people frequented this area about 12,000 years ago when the glaciers were gradually retreating. Farther exploration of the surrounding area revealed a stone circle in the center of a field overgrown with beautiful sunflowers. It was constructed by the ancients thousands of years ago. It was a medicine wheel that had an astronomical significance. It was an observatory that was built specifically to point to the sunrise and sunset of both summer and winter solstices. 
It also marked the position of the horizon of the helical risings of certain bright stars, such as Aldebaran, Sirius, and Rigel. Audrey had noticed a patch of turf was gone, perhaps removed by an animal. She decided to probe the soil there for evidence of artifacts. She began scraping away the earth. A portion of soil collapsed inward, revealing a small cavity. There was indeed a small object within the niche, a figurine that stood 30 centimeters tall, 5 centimeters wide, and 5 thick. It was a zoomorphic sculpture. It seemed to be a sort of primeval monster or a symbol representing ancient people's interpretation of such a thing. It had a vague overall human form with the head of a panther, membranous wings, and a serpentine tail. The statue displayed a curious gesture with its right hand. The thumb and little finger contact one another, while the first, middle, and third finger remain straight. It was carved out of ivory from the tusk of a woolly mammoth. Radiocarbon dating determined it to be 10,000 years old. The trouble began, however right after Audrey made physical contact with the figurine. First, she heard what sounded like a low ringing noise in her ears, like tinnitus. It would gradually begin to rise in intensity and volume until it changed into a sort of desolate and threatening cry. It sounded like a man and something else. It had a quality of what could only be described as infinite distance. Intrusive thoughts began to harass her, a series of images formed in her mind. She saw a vast expanse at nighttime. The stars were prominent in the inky abyss that was the sky. Nearby trees gently swayed from a cool breeze, and she saw a field of sunflowers surrounding a circle of cyclopean stones. It was the medicine wheel. A shuffling sound caught her attention. She glimpsed shifting soil at the sacred site. An indistinct personage began to rise from the ground to stand fully upright with soil crumbling off its frame. The shape began to make a guttural clicking noise like some kind of prehistoric carnivore. Two red pinpoints of bioluminescence sparked into existence in its eyes. The form raised its right hand and touched the tips of its thumb and little finger while keeping the other finger straight. The spectral shape spoke to her with a demonic voice. I see you. From her colleagues' perspectives, they thought she was having a heat stroke or something of that nature. She would snap out of the state and collapse to her knees, her mind reeling. The things Audrey said would make little sense at first. But in the back of my mind, the memory of the demon monk would return to me. The bronze amulet I discovered in the permafrost of the Tibetan plateau. In that position of time and space, I would become momentarily entangled with ancient evil. Immediately afterwards, a strong gust of wind would kick up dirt and dust nearly knocking her over. The burst of wind shook the trees in the field of sunflowers. After that day, Audrey would never feel alone. She would hear incomprehensible whispering in her ears. Sometimes, she would hear footsteps directly behind her. She would turn around, only to find nobody there. She felt as if she became trapped in a spider web, and she was overwhelmed by depression and fear. Soon, she would start seeing movement in her peripheral vision, dark shapes darting back and forth, and yet again, nothing was there. Faces would appear in the windows of her home, forcing her to close all the blinds and curtains. Her phone would ring, and on the other end would be disembodied gibberish and static. When she looked at the caller display, no identification would appear. Audrey went to see the doctor and was given a prescription to calm her nerves and to help her relax. For a time, the prescription helped ease her anxiety, allowing her to focus. 
She felt that deep within her mind that these strange occurrences were not psychological and that something was truly happening to her. That's when she contacted me. Audrey brought with her a dusty oil knapsack. Inside it was the accursed figurine wrapped in a towel. She told me not to touch the nameless statue with my bare hands. She explained to me that everyone who handled the figurine was found brutally murdered. The cause of death was exsanguination. Afterwards, their necks were brutally snapped or their heads crushed by some unknowable strength. She handed me the knapsack and told me to lock the artifact somewhere safe. She walked away from me with her head hung low, leaving me alone in the upper level of the dinosaur exhibit overlooking a massive brontosaurus skeleton. My attempts to contact her ended fruitlessly. Her colleagues told me she'd gone missing. I questioned them if she said anything. They told me that she was speaking about strange things, ranting about shadows watching and the spirit of the lonely places. I felt my heart sink into my stomach. One week later, the mutilated remains of a female washed up onto the bank of the Tuscany River with deep puncture marks on her body. The majority of her blood was missing. Her head was hanging on only by a few shreds of muscle tissue. Her mouth was full of sand and stones. Her teeth and jaws smashed to bits. Farther investigation revealed that her remains were infested with an unknown species of protozoa. She suffered the same fate as those who handled the figurine. And just the same, she too was shipped off to the CDC because of the mysterious biological contamination. Audrey had been visited by the wrath of the quantum vampire. It is a loathsome thing, ancient and primitive, yet more advanced than Homo sapiens. It is an outside alien consciousness that is capable of infiltrating a host body and taking complete and total control of the nervous system. It does this by entangling itself with the molecular makeup of the vessel. The body and mind succumb to the will of the invading being and is subsequently changed into a hideous bloodthirsty parasite with an indefinite lifespan. According to Eldritch Tomes, it takes one full year for the process to complete. Afterwards, the newly formed organism is more hardy and resistant and possesses several frightening abilities. The vessel becomes the embodiment of gluttony, greed, and excess. It is never satisfied after drinking the blood of its victim or several. It is always seeking to inflict endless cruelties onto mankind. It is the great enveloping cosmic darkness. It likes to indulge itself on the suffering of man. It likes to watch us despair. It forces us to see ourselves as animal and ugly, to remind us that we are beasts with big brains. It originates from a place that is distant yet close. It comes from the spaces between. I think there is a real possibility that one day the Large Hadron Collider may offer a glimpse into these spaces. I worry that for a brief moment in time, the barriers between the real and unreal will be down and the great old ones might be looking in on us, perhaps to sit next to the campfire and tell us the true horrors of reality. Throughout the history of mankind, the quantum vampire has been invited into our plane of existence through forbidden and arcane rituals. There are eldritch tomes around the world that have been written about these entities. They are records of mankind's attempt to comprehend these otherworldly beings whose existence stretches back to an unfathomable gulf of night. These are the known avatars of the quantum vampire. 1. The 170,000 year old remains of a female Neanderthal were discovered in a cave located in Italy. The skeleton had several unusual characteristics. 2. 
Sometime during the last ice age, a Paleo-Siberian would become the next manifestation. 3. The third would take on the form of a young Aboriginal boy named Little Crow on the Canadian Plains. I believe the legend of the Wendigo was inspired by the creature. 4. During the 13th dynasty of Egypt, a pharaoh willingly summoned the being into himself to gain everlasting life. He was defeated by the Egyptian army. They decapitated him, dismembered his body, and burned him to ash. To their horror, the entity was released from the pharaoh's body and was carried away by the wind to seek another host. 5. After inhabiting the pharaoh, the disembodied being invaded the body of a slave and escaped into the wilderness. To this very day, there are stories of a lone figure who stalks the desert at night. 6. The daughter of a praetorian guard was bitten by a cloaked fiend. She would go on to terrorize the Roman Empire. 7. A Greek astronomer who was suspected of being a sorcerer inadvertently became the vessel for the quantum vampire. 8. During the Middle Ages, the people of Central Asia were tormented by the so-called demon monk. I would have a horrific experience with a fiend on the Tibetan plateau as a child in the year 1988. 9. The southern uplands of Scotland are said to be the hunting grounds of a druid with black eyes and a torn mouth with jagged teeth. 10. There are legends of an Aztec priestess who fed on the blood of children during the night. 11. Near the Big Cypress Swamp is an ancient burial ground that is said to be the lair of a female native warrior that drinks the blood of those who dare to trespass. 12. A Polish priest who strayed from his beliefs sought out a new supreme being during the Age of Discovery. He made a black pilgrimage into the Carpathian Mountains seeking a new lord, and he found it. Incident at Gemini Lake A young woman named Tara has spent the last several months seeking treatment for PTSD and depression at the Zenith Center for Mental Health, just an hour's drive west of Carswell. I was granted permission to interview her. This is her experience. We had an Indian summer in the autumn of 2012. Imagine 28.9 degrees Celsius around this part of the country in the middle of October. That doesn't happen very often. Me, Emma, Dalton, and Rusty his Rhodesian Ridgeback, all piled into the Subaru Outback and made the 40-minute drive to Gemini Lake for one last dip in the water before the cold. The lake was abandoned at this time of the year, and we had the place to ourselves. It was ideal. There was still some light in the sky when we arrived. Dalton barely brought his car to a stop when Emma yanked off her hoodie and cracked open a beer. Dalton let Rusty jump out onto the sand as he lit up a smoke. The sunset behind Sentinel Mountain was such a beautiful sight, the way the light rippled on the water. On the lake, I could see a flock of common loon preparing for their winter migration, the black and white tuxedo birds indifferent to our presence. Have you ever heard the haunting call of the loon? It travels for a long distance. It sends shivers down my spine every time I hear it. We were all transfixed to the song on the lake. I spotted something just a bit down farther on the lake shore. I pointed it out and we made our way down to take a closer look. It was just a stack of flat stones. From the way it was piled, it kind of resembled a human figure with its arms stretched out facing the lake. There was something wrapped around it. I knelt down next to the stone pile and picked it up. It was an old necklace made of bird skulls. They looked like they came from crows. It was something an indigenous person might have worn a long time ago. Rusty was circling it with intense curiosity, sniffing it and wagging his tail. I pocketed the bone necklace. Finders keepers.
Dalton turned to face me with a weird smirk on his face. Halloween is going to be here in a few weeks, you know. Emma punched Dalton on the shoulder and laughed. Rusty jumped on his hind legs and playfully pawed at Dalton with his forelegs. Emma motioned towards the lake with her can of beer. Maybe some weirdo in a hockey mask is going to jump out of the lake and hack us to pieces with a machete. Dalton flicked his cigarette butt out onto the water and grabbed a beer from the cooler. He took a long swig of it and let out a burp. If anyone even thinks about messing with you girls out here, I'll rip his head off. Dalton knocked over the stone man with his foot and chugged down the rest of his beer. Just then, a breeze of wind came out of nowhere. I thought nothing of it until it became a sudden gust that nearly knocked me over. All of the trees swayed in the wind, causing the dry autumn leaves to crumble off the branches. And just as fast as the wind came, it stopped. Rusty froze in place and perked up his ears. It was as if he heard something that we could not. In fact, everything became quiet. Even the song of the loon stopped. Rusty began to whine and whimper, tucking his tail between his legs. He was spooked by something. That's when he started digging into the sand with his paws and pushing it aside with his nose. Rusty bit down onto something with his teeth and yanked out an object of some sort. It was an old and cracked leather wallet. He brought it to Dalton. Would you look at that? Good boy. Dalton brushed off the remaining sand and opened up the wallet. He pulled out crumbling banknotes and some coins. There was also a driver's license. Dalton examined it. Looks like a Mr. Jacob Wingate forgot to take his wallet. Poor sucker. Emma grabbed the license from Dalton's hands and took a look for herself. I thought that name sounded familiar. Wasn't he the guy that went missing just a while ago? My dad was part of the search team looking for him. Emma put the license back into the wallet and placed it next to the knocked over stone man. She had a weird look on her face. I'd never seen her look so nervous before. We stripped down to our swimwear and raced down the wooden dock with Rusty not far behind. Although I noticed something strange about him, he kept pausing to look back at the trees. Dalton was the first to jump off the dock and dived right into the lapping water. Emma let out a hoot and jumped right in after Dalton. She resurfaced and let out a scream from the cold water. I stood on the edge of the dock with my arms crossed, hesitating. Dalton had a big grin on his face as he stared up at me. I reminded them that there was snow on the forecast for the following week. Emma was doing a backstroke and scoffed at me. I was distracted once more by the whimpering of Rusty. I turned around to look at him to see him looking back at the dark trees again. I saw, or rather at the time, thought I saw something. It was just for a blip of a nanosecond. For the briefest amount of time. I could have sworn I spotted a flash of red moving between the trees. Before I could get a better look, cold and wet arms wrapped around me. Dalton's grinning face pressed up against the side of my cheek, and the next thing I knew I found myself falling into freezing cold water. My heart skipped a beat from the temperature shock. Afterwards, when we finally had enough of the water, we made our way back to the shore. Dalton built a small fire. We all huddled around the dancing flames, basking in the gentle glow of the beach fire. Emma rested in Dalton's arms as I sat across from them staring into the flames with Rusty at my side. I remember gazing up at the sky to see the first stars of the evening twinkle into view. The Big Dipper became clear as the sunlight began to fade behind Sentinel Mountain. Emma slowly stood up and stretched. Well, I gotta pee. I watched Emma make her way towards the nearby brush for some privacy. Rusty was curled up on the sand next to me, staring off into the distance. I'd also noticed that Dalton was unusually quiet, staring into the fire. 
It was as if he was in deep thought, like he had entered some kind of a trance. He started singing to himself. This old man, he played one, he played knick-knack on my thumb. With a knick-knack paddywhack, give a dog a bone, this old man came rolling home. A blood-curdling scream startled us, bringing Dalton out of his trance. Rusty jumped up, letting out a whine. He took off running towards the source of the scream. Once again, another scream sounded. It was the high-pitched scream of a woman. It was Emma. I glanced at Dalton with concern, and he looked back at me with wide eyes. We got up and rushed towards the brush on the trail of Rusty. This time, there was another cry, a loud, painful yelp. A dark shape came flying towards us from the brush and landed on the sand between us. The crumpled and mangled heap was Rusty. The dog's body twitched and convulsed violently. He was broken in half, folded like an accordion. Dalton let out a sorrowful cry. Oh my God, what the hell? Amid the chaos and confusion, Emma emerged from the brush, shambling towards us holding the side of her neck with a hand. There was blood spurting out of a wound on the side of her neck. She was sobbing in complete horror and shock. Dalton took one step towards her. Emma? And just as soon as she appeared, there was a powerful gust of wind. It happened so fast. The sand next to her just exploded, as if something massive landed right next to her, and in the next instant, she was just gone. Emma's desperate cries echoed through the twilight on the shores of Gemini Lake. Soon, the scream stopped. There was now only total silence. We had no idea or understanding of what had just happened. I think our minds were swirling in a daze of shock and confusion. Childhood memories of the monster under my bed returned to me. I could feel a deep chill creeping throughout my entire body. I think the fight or flight animal instinct was kicking in. A cold burst of wind kicked up sand and debris around us, and the next thing you know, a shape appeared several meters in front of us. It was a person standing barefoot on the sand. He was wearing a red zip-up jacket with a hood up and blue jeans. His clothes were frayed and tattered. They were covered in dirt and mold. It was as if he climbed out of the ground or something. He had a shock of blonde hair that wildly poked out from under the hood. There was something very wrong with him. His skin was really pale, like ash, and there was something wrong with his eyes. The whites of his were black like obsidian, and his pupils were red like the glowing embers in a campfire. That's when I knew who or what we were looking at was not a human being. I know that sounds crazy. It had the appearance of a man. It stood like a man. But there was no way it was a man. It was something that just passed off as a human at a glance. The stoic look on its face suddenly changed into a grinning smile, revealing sharp teeth. It started to sing. Its voice was deep and gravelly. This old man, he played too. He played knick-knack on my shoe with a knick-knack paddywhack. Give a dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. Dalton was knocked onto the ground by the thing in the red hoodie, pinning him down. Its movements were frenetic, like a rabid animal. Dalton let out a high-pitched, agonizing scream. I remember the sound of tendons ripping. Dalton writhed in pain and torment. The thing suddenly buried its face into Dalton's neck. I was completely frozen in place. I couldn't move. All I could do was stand still and watch the violent act before me. I knew my heart was racing. I could hear it beating against my chest. I started to feel numb and weak. 
my breathing was becoming labored. After the stream stopped, after Dalton stopped struggling, the thing that looked like a man reached for a nearby rock and caved Dalton's face in with one powerful swift blow. Its frenzied state lessened, and its mannerism changed. It almost seemed to become drowsy, or relaxed, like all the tension in its body left. It became lethargic. It stood up and slowly turned to face me. I could hear a weird clicking sound coming from its throat. It gradually became deeper until it changed into a rumbling bellow like what I imagined a dinosaur must have sounded like. Not only could I hear it, but I could also feel it in my bones. The thing approached me. The smell of mildew and decay, blood and dirt came from the creature in waves. I collapsed to my knees sobbing. The world around me began to phase in and out of existence as if I was going to faint. I swear to you, I could feel the air around the thing rippling. It was like there was some kind of charge in the air. It spoke to me. When a man looks at an animal, what does he see? He sees a source of sustenance. What do you think I see when I look at mankind? It sat down cross-legged on the sand in front of me. It stretched out an open hand, palm facing skywards. You took something that's mine. The thing was referring to the bone necklace that we found on the pile of rocks, the stone man. I reached a trembling hand into my pocket and retrieved the bone jewelry and handed it over. The creature put the necklace on the crow skulls resting on its chest. It spoke once more. How fortunate for you. I'm allowing you to go on and live a long happy life until you return to ash and dust. But never forget that I am everywhere and everything here is mine. I am the land. I am the wind. I am the trees and the animals. I am everlasting. In the blink of an eye, it was gone. I was all alone on the beach of Gemini Lake. The music of the common loon began to resonate across the lake once again, like a coffin choir for my dead friends. Those aquatic birds with red eyes that were witness to the events that occurred on the sand. I gazed up at the sky with teary eyes and caught sight of the northern lights rippling and dancing across the night sky. Journal Entry People still remember that year, when a young woman was found wandering alongside the highway three days later, so deranged by what she encountered, that she had to be committed. Urban legends have sprung up among the youth living in the region. The thing in red, Johnny Angel, and the Carswell Ghoul are just some of the nicknames given to the being. Nobody wants to admit it, but there is an air about the place. Something beyond our comprehension has been going on for a long time, and things are only going to get worse. I asked Tara if she could take a look at a picture. She agreed. I withdrew a missing persons poster and presented it to her. Missing. Jacob Wingate, age 23, was last seen around 9 o'clock p.m. on October 28, 2011 at Carswell Public Library. He was seen leaving the parking lot driving a blue 1977 Pontiac Ventura. He is 6 foot 1 inches tall, weighs approximately 198 pounds, has blue eyes and blonde hair. He was wearing a bright red hoodie with blue jeans. Anyone with information should contact the Carswell RCMP detachment or call 911 if seen. The expression that showed on Tara's face after I showed her the missing poster was one of abject horror. Final Entry Cycle of the Vampire I saw him 
on a moonless night while desperately clinging to my sanity. It was the summer solstice of 2017 when a young couple decided to go on a pleasant summit hike to Sentinel Mountain. It is a relatively easy scramble on the eastern slopes which overlook the tranquil waters of Gemini Lake. These slopes can be reached by following a steep fire road from the parking area at the lake. Upon reaching the top, they took in the surrounding beauty of the landscape. There, they enjoyed a small snack and beverage. Afterwards, they made their way to the Standing Stones. On the summit of Sentinel Mountain is an archaeological site that was believed to be a medicine wheel and burial site. There is a mound surrounded by a ring of crumbling boulders with stone circles and effigies nearby. The mound was excavated in 1975 by a team of archaeologists from Asheville University, which uncovered a burial pit with human remains and a myriad of artifacts. The site was dated to 15,000 years ago. The wife caught sight of a cleft in the ground not far from the ancient site. Upon taking a closer look, they discovered the entrance to a small cave. The cave was no more than 5 feet high and 11 feet wide and 25 feet deep. The husband noticed a slightly raised portion of the floor was bordered by a circle of rocks. Just outside the circle was a neat pile of flat stones which were stacked in such a way to resemble a human being with outstretched arms. Nagging curiosity compelled them to dig into the soil with their bare hands and brushing the dirt aside, they discovered human remains. The couple reported their find to the RCMP who dispatched officers to investigate. Shortly afterwards, the RCMP contacted the Asheville University located in the nearby city of Carswell. A team of archaeologists were assembled to excavate what were the remains of an ancient mummified child. A small bone fragment was collected from the mummy and radiocarbon dating revealed that he died nearly 5,000 years ago. This is what was officially released to the public. There are several anomalies that have been kept secret. An individual who wishes to remain anonymous contacted me. This person explained that the burial site itself was not ancient, but rather it was dug up very recently and that the remains were placed in there. Things would take an even stranger turn when the autopsy was performed. Inexplicable discoveries that would defy our understanding of biology and the natural world. The first thing to note were the physical characteristics of the child's mandibles. All of the teeth were razor sharp. The jaws were rigid with tendons, muscles, and ligaments that gave it flexibility comparable to that of a snake. Despite the apparent outward appearance of the withered corpse, the musculature beneath showed little decay and was still red. Truly a curious find indeed. It was revealed that the brain and several other internal organs were fresh as well as not desiccated as one would expect. Both circulatory and nervous systems were also in relatively good condition, although the heart was abnormally enlarged. It was double in size compared to that of a normal heart. All of this was sealed in by the leathery and petrified exterior outer flesh. Analysis of the stomach contents revealed a copious amount of partially digested human blood. Farther analysis revealed that the stomach was teeming with an unusual form of protozoa that were actively consuming the blood. The parotid salivary glands, the spleen and cerebral spinal fluid were also infected with scores of these microscopic organisms. The farther they investigated, the more bizarre things became. The investigation was brought to a sudden stop when a group of men in hazmat suits stormed the university and confiscated all of the research and evidence, including the cadaver. Everyone involved with the find were harassed and threatened by men dressed in black suits, ordering them to keep quiet. Sadly, 
The young people who made the discovery atop Sentinel Mountain fell victims to a rare and highly aggressive form of anemia. Both of their lives were extinguished by the very same protozoa found inhabiting the hellish mummy. The very act of disturbing the dirt with their bare hands allowed the invading microorganisms to access their bodies. One startling find revealed that the white blood cells of the deceased were mutating into the vampire protozoa. Their very biology was being rewritten even in death. Their remains were shipped off to the CDC for farther study and containment. Inquiries from families and friends have gone unanswered. The body that was discovered on the summit was that of an innocent child from a forgotten time. Little Crow was killed in an act of war. His lifeless body was brought to the top of Sentinel Mountain by his father accompanied by a shaman who performed a forbidden ritual that called forth an ancient evil from beyond the stars. It never had a physical form of its own before. It stood up in the shape and characteristic of a human being. It became a profanity against the natural world. Little Crow has haunted the mountains and surrounding landscape since time immemorial. The indigenous people were particularly aware they constantly incorporated depictions of this creature into their carvings and statues. They believed that this iconography would ward off the spiritual and psychic circumstances that would precipitate in attacks by enemy tribes. They placed spiritually charged items at burial sites for protection and strength. But what of the child himself? Did any part of his true original self remain? Sadly, yes, he was fully conscious of what was going on and the existence he was leading. But it was the will of something that emerged from an unknown gulf of night that was driving his body. He watches himself committing unspeakable acts upon human beings, unable to resist and unable to prevent the death and destruction that he caused. Little Crow was being used as an avatar by this eldritch personification who invaded his mind and body, turning him into a bloodthirsty vampire. Something happened. The lifeless husk of Little Crow was found buried on the summit of Sentinel Mountain. Vampires never die except through violent means. But that doesn't mean it's the end of a vampire. According to Eldritch Tomes, the outside alien consciousness is able to disengage from the carcass to be carried off by the wind and desperately seek out a new vessel. My informant saw no obvious cause of death. There is another way. A nameless ritual can be performed where the quantum vampire can transfer itself into a new host body of its choosing. The being saw something in Jacob that made him its next host body. Little Crow and Jacob Wingate, separated by nearly 50 centuries, both forever binded to the madness from beyond. Summer 2018 was when I made a pilgrimage of my own onto the summit of Sentinel Mountain, located southwest of Carswell. I arrived safe and sound early in the day. I believe this was the site where Little Crow was taken to be revived by the forces of darkness thousands of years ago. There was a slight stench in the air that wafted about by the mountain breeze. There was also another odor that I could detect was ozone, that distinct smell detected during an electrical storm. I found it strange seeing as it was a clear and cloudless day. During my time on the summit, I couldn't help but feel an oppressive discomfort in my head. It was almost as if something was sifting through my thoughts. I approached the entrance to the small cave where the remains of Little Crow were discovered. Before entering the cavern, I put on a surgical mask, protective glasses and disposable gloves, 
I didn't want the risk of being invaded by the mysterious vampire protozoa that may or may not have been present in the black soil during my visit. I had to take a stooping posture in the mouth of the foreboding den due to the low ceiling of the cave. I switched on my flashlight to illuminate the way. The darkness of the chamber became overwhelming as I neared the former grave site of the ancient vampire. An eerie feeling began to invade my mind. It was the old saying that I felt like I was being watched. On the right side of the passage, I caught sight of something on the wall. It caused me to instinctively jump back in fright. On the wall next to me was what appeared to be rock art. The art was not ancient, but very recent from the color and freshness of the paint. It was a mural that depicted the face of a hooded man with light skin, blonde hair, black eyes, with burning red orbs for pupils. Its mouth was agape, revealing rows of sharp teeth. I stared into the eyes of the mural. The face seemed very familiar to me. It bore a striking resemblance to the avatar of the 13th vampire. There was no mention of the mural from the couple who found the ancient mummy, nor from the team of archaeologists who excavated the area. It must have been someone with a keen interest in the rising ghoulish myths in the area. Tales of a boogeyman who stalks the night questing for new horrors and determined to quench its infinite thirst. In this case, the truth is stranger than fiction. Nobody wants to admit that there's been something going on in these lands for a very long time. Mention the word vampire and people will scoff. But that works in favor of the vampire. Its power relies on darkness and obscurity. It is a thing with no shape or form, but it exists the same way that wind exists. You can see its effects. Once the quantum vampire takes a host, you can also see its effects. It is alien. It is the other. Its very existence cannot be encompassed. It is said that Copernicus took Earth out of the center of the universe. Darwin took humans out of the center of the biological world. But it is the quantum vampire that takes humans and uses them for its own means. Humans who believe they are above everything and are at the top of the food chain. How wrong we are. I became fixated on the mural. I carefully examined the details of the image. I began thinking aloud. Are you awake, Jacob Wingate? Are you asleep, Jacob Wingate? My mind was busy with so many intrusive thoughts. Once I brushed them aside, I noticed the surrounding darkness became thicker. I became aware of that ozone smell from outside. I must be very deliberate now and choose my words carefully. Perhaps it was the cave acoustics. It started off as an indistinct pulse or rumble. It changed into a whisper. Imagine for a minute if somebody walked up right behind you and got right up close to your ear without your knowing, what are you looking for, little one? My skin began to crawl. A shiver ran down my spine like bony fingers. I spun around frantically shining the light. Nothing was there. I was alone. I listened carefully my hearing sharpened by the silence of the cave, not a footfall, not even a peep. Satisfied that I didn't have unexpected company, I pressed on. A place like this can easily wreak havoc on a person's imagination. At the end of the passage was a shallow depression in the cavern floor. It was the burial site. A ring of stone surrounded the hole with a stack of flat stones neatly piled in the shape and aspect of a human being. I shined the light into the empty grave and spotted a layer of charcoal and partially burned items on the bottom. I gazed up at the roof and saw where the flames licked. 
I carefully reached into the grave and pulled up the charred remnants of a photo album. I flipped it open and saw family photographs of a father and mother, a girl and two boys. The girl was named Samantha. She was the elder. David was the middle child and Jacob was the youngest of the three. A single photograph slipped out from the album onto the ground. I swiftly picked it up. It was another picture of Jacob. He was holding a large black cat with piercing green eyes. I turned the picture over. Written on the back was Jacob in Salem, 2008. Little is known about Jacob. He was a very secretive individual. He was born February 14th in the year 1988 to Robert Wingate and Matilda Dombrowski. Jacob had a very happy childhood, according to his parents. They gave him just about everything he wanted. He received good grades in school and was often described as a quiet and polite student. He got along just fine with his older siblings. They would spend countless summer afternoons playing on the shores of Gemini Lake. Other times, he would go to the local arcade with them and sink coins into the machines. He was deeply passionate about astronomy. He would often spend many nights gazing up at the cosmos. Jacob was a bit of a loner. He seemed to live in a world of his own. He would go on long solitary walks or bicycle on the local trails. He was also a lover of all things ancient and strange. He was also said to possess a quirky sense of humor. Later in life, he earned a living working at a sawmill where his father was a respected foreman. Jacob was also a member of the Search and Rescue Volunteer Association of Canada. He was known to be proficient at finding people. Other members of his team joked that he had a sixth sense. There was a suspicion that he had a mental disorder of some type. It became even more pronounced after his horrifying encounter with Little Crow in the National Park. He did seek treatment at the Zenith Center for Mental Health. Jacob felt the need to help others because of a childhood event. Samantha, the oldest of the Wingate children, explained to me when Jacob was making his way home from school one day, he decided to take a shortcut through a nearby thicket. It was autumn and there were leaves everywhere. There just happened to be a nice pile of leaves waiting to be kicked. What little kid couldn't resist? Jacob went for it and as he did, the sound of breaking sticks startled him. He found himself falling into an open drainage hole. Fortunately for him, he reacted fast and was able to catch on to the edge of the opening. Below him was darkness with the sound of flowing water. Jacob summoned all his strength and pulled himself up and out of the hole. Ever since that experience, he felt compelled to help those in need. But now, he's become an abomination that preys on the weak and the wounded. A profound feeling of sadness came over me. The sound of crumbling rocks startled me. I forgot my bearings and swiftly stood up. I bashed my head against the low hanging roof of the cave and collapsed to my knees. Jolts of pain radiated through my skull and down my spine. I turned the flashlight to see where the sound came from. It was the stack of flat stones. They'd been knocked over. Just beyond the heap of crumbled rocks was something I hadn't noticed before. There was a small hole in the wall, another passageway. A stealthy rustling sound came from that opening. That's when I saw it. Two yellow eyes. Have you ever seen the glowing eyes of an animal when you shine a light in their face while they're off in the distance? That's exactly what I saw. It emerged from the opening and approached me. I saw a spotted brown and silvery coat, a wide face and tufted ears. It was a medium sized wildcat, a lynx. 
A deep guttural growl emitted from its throat. It darted towards me. I instinctively brought my arms up in a defensive position in anticipation of a mauling. To my relief, the wildcat bounded over me and sped off towards the outside world. It's hard to say how long I sat in that darkness, but the throbbing agony in my skull and neck urged me to conclude my search. I slowly and painfully stood up, careful not to bump my skull a second time. I made haste out of the tomb and was greeted by welcoming sunlight where vampires cannot follow. To clarify, vampires are not harmed or killed by sunlight. It simply hinders their vision. It's more of an irritant to them. Although they can withstand the low light levels during dawn and dusk, they very much prefer the dark of night. I was alarmed by the sudden calling and chirping of a solitary magpie perched atop one of the standing stones. The curious black and white bird watched me intently. One for sorrow, as the old nursery rhyme goes. A slow and cold horror grew within me. Later, I found lodging in a nearby inn. I was sore and exhausted from my ordeal in the cave. I decided to eat a light dinner and go to bed early. It didn't take very long for me to doze off after my head hit the pillow. Pictures come to the eyes of one trying to sleep. A dream. A nightmare. I was a disembodied observer slowly drifting through the gutted remains of an abandoned building surrounded by forest. Next, I found myself moving through a gloomy tunnel. I was following a black cat with bright green eyes. It was carefully moving across a floor littered with countless human bones. I followed the cat until I reached a chamber where it darted into the shadows and out of my sight. Smoke was rising and swirling from a semicircle of burning barrels. The orange glow from the flames danced on the cement walls. They were lined with rows of rusty steam pipes and valves. A large mound of soil was in the middle of these burning barrels. A malevolent figure stood firmly on the top. It was something that had the appearance of a person, but it was not a person. It wore clothes, a red hood and blue jeans, frayed and tattered, caked with dirt and grime and gore. A necklace of bird skulls hung loosely around its neck. I knew what was inhabiting the shape and form of that young man. It has many names. The Great Old One, the Otherness, the Dweller of the Gulf, the Demon from the Stars, the Wendigo. The Thing was not alone. A cowering shape was also at the top of the mound, a homeless woman. Her hair was wild and tangled. Tears and mucus dripped off of her face in the dim orange haze. The look on her face told me she was on the brink of insanity. The hooded figure loomed over her, its burning red pupils dilated like a camera aperture. It was studying her. It got right into her face and said a single word. So. It suddenly knocked the helpless woman down onto her backside and looked at her leg. It bit down with razor sharp teeth and the woman howled in unimaginable agony. The creature ripped a huge chunk of tissue and spat it out. It went for another bite and this time bit directly into the femoral artery. It began drinking. I could see the life gradually slipping from the poor woman as her fluids were drained. Once she was extinguished, the fiend withdrew its dripping maw from her leg. It swiftly wrenched her neck. The human abomination remained knelt next to its finished prey and stared into the darkness. A deep guttural clicking sound came from its throat content with a blood meal. It gently rolled the body down the mound. The hooded figure made a kissing noise, like it was trying to get the attention of a pet. 
A large mountain lion lumbered from the inky recess. Its coat glowed in the dim orange light from the nearby fire. There was something peculiar about this animal. It was immensely old. Its fur was faded and gray. The ancient panther sniffed the dead woman and started pawing at her remains. It clamped its powerful jaws around her head and yanked her away into the shadows. The hooded figure shifted its gaze on me. It spoke with power and authority. Are you awake, little one? Are you asleep, little one? I opened my eyes. I remember staring up at the ceiling, back at the inn. Everything was vast and the orange glow from the setting sun beaming through the window. Eventually, I would return to my slumber. My eyes would snap open once more. Darkness would greet me. I could sense that something was wrong. I tried to sit up, but found that I could not move. I was paralyzed. There was a slight glow coming from the front of me. Something materialized on the dresser. An object. There was some kind of distortion to it, like the heat shimmer on a road during a hot summer day. It was a small ivory statue, a vague human form, membranous wings jutting out from the shoulder blades, a panther head with a mouth stretched in a feral grin, a serpentine tail poised to strike the right hand displaying some kind of gesture with the thumb and pinky finger making contact while the remaining three were straight. Upon realization, a sharp and intense burning pain in my chest began. The pain radiated into my jaw and my left arm. I was having difficulties breathing. It was the accursed figurine carved from the ivory of a woolly mammoth 10,000 years ago, unearthed by archaeologists in the National Park. It was the idol given to me for safekeeping by an elderly woman, the head archaeologist. She made it clear to me not to touch the figurine with my bare hands, just like she and her colleagues did. A curse was transmitted to them, allowing them to become entangled with a quantum vampire. It brutally killed each of them one by one. I had placed the object inside a heavy duty lockbox made of lead for safekeeping. I then stored the lockbox in a self storage facility. There was a whisper, a voice. Something was speaking to me in my head. It was singing. Oh, what a night for sweethearts, stars in the sky above. This is our chance for sweet romance. Let's make this a night of love. The mechanical growling of a vehicle pulling into the parking lot caused my heart to flutter. The room was flooded by the blinding headlights of a car parking next to my rental. The engine was shut off and the glaring lights faded. Dread and foreboding and fear began to manifest within me. I became overwhelmed by confusion. A car door was opened and then shut. I heard the room door being unlocked. Silence. The door slowly creaked open. I became conscious of the earthy smell of soil and mold mixed with carrion. A presence. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, I could feel the end of the mattress buckle under the weight of something. In my frozen state, I could see a hooded shape walking up on the bed. Next came the crushing pressure of immense weight on me. The thing sat down on my chest like a gargoyle. Dry earth rattled down onto the bedsheets. The situation was reminiscent of the nightmare. 
the oil painting from 1781 by artist Henry Fuseli. I could now see the identity of my guest. Tendrils of blonde hair stuck out from beneath the hood. A disc of flies angrily buzzed around its head, picking at the sticky coagulated blood smeared around its mouth. The skin was pale and white, like freshly fallen snow. Jet black eyes with blazing red pupils fixated on me with curiosity. It placed a clawed finger over its lips. I uttered its name. The expression on its face was remote. It responded, a low cracked voice. Jacob is in here, and so is Little Crow. I am their master. It stared at me, contemplating. You do good work, little one. Write the new gospel. It playfully poked me on the nose with a forefinger. The world went black. I sat up gasping for air, covered in cold sweat. Salty tears rolled down my face. My pulse pounded in my temples. My mind was wild with a tsunami of horrifying thoughts. I was trembling with uncontrollable fear. I grabbed my keys and got into the rental car. I sped out of the parking lot. I was compelled to drive over to the self storage facility. I accessed the storage unit and opened the lockbox. To my complete horror, the statue was missing. It had been reclaimed. On my way back to the car, I saw something that startled me. It was a large domestic cat. It was sitting on the hood of the car. Its black fur rippled in the gentle breeze. It stared at me with glowing eyes, maybe a trick of the streetlights. It watched me with intense curiosity as I cautiously approached. Gracefully, it jumped off the car and disappeared into the moonless night. I directed my gaze upwards to catch sight of the brilliant billowing northern lights dancing across the inky blackness of space. <laughs>